struggle. Explaining consent through food analogies, cancel culture claims a fake victim, and all the latest on developments with Dan. A series of educational videos aimed at informing teenagers about sexual consent have drawn widespread criticism across the board, with some even being deleted from the Good Society website. Created as part of, of the federal government's Respect Matters campaign, the videos address themes of respectful relationships and consent through analogies with a shark, a taco, and milkshakes. When one person takes action without an agreement. You do, huh? Well, drink it. Drink it all. What are you doing? The videos have copped flack for trivialising such a serious matter, as well as their unclear messaging by using unfamiliar terms like moving the line and the field model. And some of the online resources on the website introduce even more confusing terms like the end zone, the maybe zone and the action zone, as if navigating the friend zone wasn't complicated enough. The content hasn't been well received by politicians either, with Labor's James Molino calling the milkshake video cringeworthy, while Sarah Mitchell from the Nationals labelled the videos woeful. I mean, getting bipartisan agreement on anything is notoriously difficult, so the videos must be pretty bad if both sides of politics aren't fans. But then again, maybe tacos really are the unifying force that Old El Paso made them out to be. How do you decide between crunchy and soft tacos? Either way, with reports the project costs $3.79 million, taxpayers around the country aren't going to be thrilled. So let's cross to Suze from PR to see how the government's dealing with the backlash. Thanks, Sam. But let's not blow this out of proportion. I'd hardly say that the government has been receiving backlash over its milkshake slash taco slash shark consent videos. A few minor grievances at best. Now, the government has been well-intentioned, and it's just been horribly misconstrued by the public. Now, some people have questioned, why use tacos in the campaign at all? But it's pretty simple. The eggplant emojis have been around for a while, so why not introduce another sexy food icon? Taco Tuesdays could have a whole new meaning. And in terms of the milkshake, I'm struggling to see what all the fuss is about. Skincare is all the rage these days. Who doesn't love a bit of exfoliation? And at six bucks a facial, I thought it'd be a winner for sure amongst cash-strapped kids. And as for the shark, well, Scotty's a huge Sharkies fan, so that was just a little Easter egg dropped in there to please the boss. And as for those of you questioning the use of euphemisms and metaphors instead of proper terminology, well, this isn't something new. Before it was birds and the bees, and now it's Mexican and milkshakes. Still pretty catchy if you ask me. Back to you, Sam. Good to see you back spinning the facts, Suze. Over the last few months, influential conservatives have been turning to their newest boogeyman to try to drum up controversy. It's called cancel culture. That's right, cancel culture is the latest liberal craze and it's coming after you and your family. Remember the zany children's books by Dr. Seuss? Cancelled. What about those adorable Mr. Potato Head toys? Cancelled. Enjoy eating a golden gay time? Cancelled. It doesn't stop there though, people are getting cancelled too. Make a remark that the woke mob doesn't like? Cancelled. Support Trump as a Hollywood actor? Cancelled. Joke about sexual assault on tape? Can'ts actually, that's fine for some reason. But in all seriousness, conservatives have been losing their collective minds over things that aren't even really true. The golden gay time is still around. Dr. Seuss hasn't been cancelled. You can still buy your Mr. Potato Heads. The latest example of this fake hysteria was recently exposed by The Chaser when they circulated a fake petition claiming Fairy Bread was offensively named, which found its way onto numerous news sites despite a number of red flags. So here with some more insight into how food is being cancelled, as well as with her delicious Fairy Bread recipe, is our celebrity chef Kirsten Gent. The food industry has undergone a bit of a renaissance of late, be it the emergence of low FODMAP, keto, or chefs strutting their stuff on the dance floor. But the latest trend set to revolutionize the culinary world isn't a diet or a moonwalking menu. It's cancel culture. And having taken stock of the situation, I can tell you that the gastronomic lexicon is peppered with troublesome terminology poised to be canceled at any moment. Take Jackfruit for example. Jack already had his own beanstalk, and now he's got his own fruit as well. Way to perpetuate the patriarchy. Same thing for mangoes. I mean, what, are women just expected to stop? And artichokes really don't stack up either. 
now that the days of Homer strangling Bart for lols are over. And while things may get hot and steamy in the kitchen, passion fruit are just a little bit too risque. And don't even get me started on tiny teddies. Heightism means that they don't even stand a chance. I wouldn't be surprised if Grandma Pedant started their own cancelling campaign thanks to the sheer number of spelling mistakes clustered across some of Australia's most well-known brands. And due to the demonization of redheads, ginger nuts, ginger snaps and ginger beer are all heading to the rubbish bin too. And as for Heinz Big Red Tomato Soup, well it's safe to say there won't be any soup for you. Kirsten Gent there proving that everything but the soup Nazi is cancelled. Right then, we're off to a short break. Welcome back. Victorian Premier and North Face spokesmodel Daniel Andrews released a statement recently stating that he is recovering well from his nasty accident a few weeks ago. After falling on some stairs in his holiday home, Andrews faced the possibility of permanent spinal injury, but is now walking up to an hour a day. This comes after a challenging 2020 for the Premier, whose popularity rose due to his handling of the coronavirus second wave in Victoria, as well as for releasing a number one best-selling track, although it should be noted we are still waiting for his album to drop. However, despite his apparent future as a recording artist, Dan Andrews is still the Premier and will face numerous challenges in the year ahead once he's back on the job. For more on this, joining us live via Zoom from his home for an exclusive interview is the Honourable Daniel Andrews. Hello, Mr Premier, how are you? I'm grateful. I'm proud. That's great to hear. It seems like you've got a bit of an issue with your camera, but we'll push on. If I may, what sort of treatment have you been receiving for your injuries? So it's a real mix of both uh, high-tech high as well as just common sense, old-fashioned stuff. So it's not one thing, it's a combination of all those things. Sounds like the doctors know what they're doing. Now, if you can cast your mind back to when you had your accident, what was going through your mind right before you slipped on those steps? Uh, we know and understand that this is a very significant step. It's very challenging, it's very dynamic, of course, but the more certainty we can bring to this task, then the more reliable the decisions are, the more, the more reliable each of those steady and safe steps are. Ah, OK, sounds like you were very concerned about those steps. I, think, I don't think it's unreasonable to say that there are a whole range of potential next steps that will come at a very significant cost. Uh, and I mean that in all of its senses. Are you suggesting you're going to be taking action against the steps? Because that would surely be an unprecedented move for a Premier. It's, it's, uh, it is a very significant issue. And as you rightly point out, that's not one that's, uh, that I can make announcements about. Um, OK. Now, famously, last year, Victorians celebrated the end of lockdown by getting on the beers. Once you've fully recovered, will you be heading down to the pub to get on the beers? And what do you think the mood will be like? Oh, look, I'll, I'll leave the um, mood analysis to others, but I think what I know, what is a fact, is that this is very, very difficult. As best we can tell, the pub is shut. That's not appropriate. No, Mr Andrews, the pubs have been open for months. Wait a second, are we talking to the real Dan Andrews? Let me, let, let me come back to you on that. As soon as I can provide you with further details, I will. So that's a no then. OK. Well, thanks to whoever set this prank up then, I guess. Anyway, with live sports slowly nudging its way back to full capacity in Victoria, fans are starting to fill stadiums like the good old days of 2019. But internationally, the situation remains much more precarious, with more than just a few question marks still hanging over how the Olympics will function. Our sports reporter, Soraya, has more. The 2020 Tokyo Olympics is perhaps the most important sporting event of 2021. And although the decision has already been made to ban international fans from attending the Games, there remain a number of important COVID-related issues that need to be addressed. So today, let's take a look at some of these unique circumstances of hosting a Games in the midst of a pandemic, and especially how this affects Australia and our Australian athletes. Because after all, if I've learned anything from sport, it's that being Australian makes us better and more important than anyone else. The first issue is vaccinations. Now, the Olympic Committee has stated that athletes won't be required to be vaccinated, but it will be recommended. Of course, if this recommendation is viewed anything like I treat recommended serving sizes on food packages, then I can't imagine a whole lot of athletes will be getting the jab. 
But there is increasing pressure on nations to ensure that all of their athletes are vaccinated by the time they get sent to the Olympics in order to reduce the risk of a super spreader event. But in Australia's case, this might raise some issues. I'm not at all convinced that we'll be up to vaccinating healthy 20 to 30 year olds by the time the Olympics roll around. Does this mean that we'll have to be relying on athletes from years gone by to represent us this year because they would have actually been vaccinated? Like, is Kathy Freeman going to be running our 400 metre race? Or maybe Dawn Fraser will be carrying our swim team this year. But assuming our athletes do get to the Games, one can only imagine the other COVID-based challenges they will face. Will Victorian athletes be able to participate in events that cover a distance of more than five kilometres? Or will anyone be allowed into the West Australian athletes' rooms? And if they are, will they risk being stuck there for two weeks? And in terms of the sports themselves, I mean, I imagine that the running events will be fine. I mean, running's part of your regular daily exercise. But what about rhythmic ribbon? That looks an awful lot like dancing to me, and I don't know if our premiers will take too kindly to that. Finally, I wonder if there will be any tension between the athletes from different states. Will everyone be angry at the New South Wales athletes for their perceived reckless behaviour? Will the New South Wales athletes then accuse everyone else of failing to follow through on the plans they all agreed upon? Or maybe the Queenslanders will be suspected of stealing certain valuable things from the Victorians. Either way, there's so much to unfold. Back to you, Sam. Good to see we've really let go of 2020, Soraya. Anyway, we're off to another break. Welcome back again. The US Defense Department has confirmed that leaked footage captured by Navy personnel in 2019 does indeed depict unidentified aerial phenomena. This wouldn't be the first time, however, a government body has successfully managed to give something up, all the while giving up nothing at all. This time, it's about UFO sightings. The first known UFO sightings go back as far as 1639, where the Puritans recalled seeing strange lights in the sky. Since then, many around the world have recounted some of the most compelling encounters they've had with the otherworldly. For more on that, we have our multiverse correspondent, Phil Forward. Evening Earth-based viewers, Phil Forward here again in my studio. Yes, people have reported UFO sightings for centuries, with some even claiming to have been abducted on their way home. In fact, I saw a UFO last night. It's really not that hard. All you've got to do is turn away from your screens and look up into the night sky. Actually, it's not that simple. If it were that easy, everyone would be doing it. I think seeing a UFO is a privilege. Why do they have to reveal themselves at all? If you've seen a UFO, it's probably because you're special. It probably means you're a conduit to the people. ET may communicate to you about the important developments we're neglecting and not paying attention to. I suppose I had one such experience last night, which is why today I must launch my new smartphone app, MoFO. Basically, if you see anything out of the ordinary, flying in the sky, or anything for that matter, open the app and point your camera at it. This anonymously submits photos or video to an open source data network. Then, smart guys like me do a little detective work. Has the Defence Department lost the plot here? This is a goddamn international security issue. Where's the UN on all of this? Next time you see something in the sky that's clearly shady, you whip out your smartphone and you shoot that MOFO. And finally, if someone tells you their UFO story, believe them. Back to you. I think we've lost Phil. Over to Hollywood now. Sorry, I mean Byron Bay, where big name actors are enjoying the local lifestyle within a country which has the virus relatively under control. Touch wood. Do we have anything wooden? No? Oh, that'll do. The likes of Zac Efron, Chris Hemsworth and Natalie Portman have all been spotted in the region recently, enjoying the Aussie sun while in between shoots for their latest films. But as there are still many Australians stranded overseas, some aren't too impressed that cashed up celebrities are being ushered into the country while citizens can't even return home. It's not the only concern coming out of the Bayside town though, as an upcoming Netflix series revolving around influencers living in up in Byron has sparked the ire of locals. And while some residents have been vocal in protesting their disapproval of the show, it's been suggested this attention may just give the show more publicity than it otherwise may have attracted. 
So whether it's megastars or Instagrammers, it seems Byron's home to quite a bit of anger at the moment. So for more, let's cross to the ever cool, calm and collected Karen from Neighbourhood Watch. Thanks, Sam. This week, I will be reporting on a matter that has been brought to my attention through many friends of the Neighbourhood Watch that live in Byron Bay. Now, in case you are unaware of what these residents are complaining about, Netflix has just announced that their new show, Byron Bays, will be filmed in Byron Bay. Shocking, I know. Now, this announcement has already been met with a lot of backlash. A petition designed to stop the show altogether has already received more than 5,000 signatures. Local businesses have even gone as far to say that the cast and crew will be unable to film on their premises altogether. Now, talking about premises, the premise of this show is absolutely pathetic. The show, quite frankly, should not be filmed at all, especially if it will impose on the livelihoods of Byron Bay residents. Now, while we're on the topic of garbage, trash, and releasing rubbish into the world. I am absolutely disgusted to be reporting that the number of Neighbourhood Watch complaints regarding rubbish and litter have only increased since people have been going out and about more frequently. It is absolutely outrageous that more than 8 million items of litter enter the marine environment every day in Australia alone. You all need to start doing your part and disposing of your rubbish in the correct manner. Your behaviour is unacceptable and I will not tolerate it. Back to you, Sam. Karen Kvetch reporting on rubbish as always. Well, that brings us to the end of another episode. And with news of a university student in the UK being hospitalised after drinking the equivalent of two litres of energy drinks every day for two years, you might want to stick to H2O to quench your thirst. Until next week, the struggle, it's real.